Welcome on to the call, uh, Professor. I'm going to take a moment to introduce you and we'll get started. I'm Frank Kaufman. I'm the head of the Professor's World Peace Academy. And uh, we continue with our series to interview prominent professors internationally. I have the very special pleasure uh, to welcome to today's program, Professor Joseph Tw Terwilliger. Um, ordinarily, as you know, as you listeners know, I go through very formal and elaborate uh, introductions, uh, and none is so fulsome as Professor Terwilliger. But there's something I want to shift a little bit in this introduction, which you'll hear. So to start, uh, Professor Terwilliger is an American geneticist and professor of neurobiology at Columbia University Medical Center and the New York State Psychiatric Institute. In addition to his scientific research, he is known for accompanying retired basketball player Dennis Rodman on his visits to North Korea, where he serves as Rodman's translator. He began his involvement with Rodman's trips to the country after meeting him uh, evidently winning an auction or winning a ball game with him at an auction. So um, I could go on and on. The, the, the non-puffed non up CV of Professor Terwilliger is, runs pages long and every bit of it is a needed word. But while I was putting this together, we ended up in emails discussing a little bit of what was going on during the COVID lockdown. And I think just this passing note of uh, professors telling me what's, what he's been up to during the lockdown is as great, as, as good an introduction as the many pages of what might be uh, read in stuffy formal situations. So Joe writes me, uh, Professor writes me, I spent much of this week setting up an online course for my Tunisian and Libyan colleagues and recruiting teachers and working on logistics in Tunisia. These days, my main scientific projects are in Venezuela and Finland. And I have projects under development in Libya, Iran, and always in the Koreas. Also, to my, as to my other career, my brass group is playing at HTTP at the, at the, this is the web address URL, philharmonicsbrass.com. And the most recent thing we did during the lockdown was a medley of film music as a tribute to essential workers. So I would encourage our listeners to, when you get a chance, uh, Google or go to YouTube and search Philharmonic Brass Film Medley, where Professor Terwilliger, a professional and, and symphony uh, tuba player uh, has put this together for essential workers. Aside from writing up results of old projects and writing a book chapter, I've read, I don't want to make him sound bragging, a lot of books, 50 or 60 books, took Farsi, Japanese, and Korean classes online and tried to watch uh, DPRK, the uh, uh, Democratic P People's Republic of Korea TV, for a couple of hours a day to keep my fluency in North Korean. So, so this, is the, this is what I uh, have chosen instead than reading a thick, uh, a formal uh, CV, is just to let you know how jo uh, Professor has spent uh, the lockdown. Unlike me, where I spent it snacking on Cheetos and gaining 15 pounds, but Professor has... Farsi and Libya and Tunisia and uh, everything under the sun. So the another interesting thing is that, and you can catch in the email, he goes, I'm watching DPRK, DPRK TV a couple of hours to keep my fluency in North Korean. Not my fluency in Korean, but my fluency in North Korean. So that subtlety or is just a throwaway line that is that so captures an extremely important nuance on the Korean peninsula means that we're speaking to a person who's not coming from book knowledge. Uh, and, for and for this reason, for 
my first in the series of interviews with Professor Terwilliger, uh, we're going to focus on uh, Korea, North Korea, South Korea, the uh, East Asian political situation, and we'll talk for a few minutes on that together. So thanks for sitting through that, Professor, and welcome to our uh, interview here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Um, so, so with your... I'm sure that I'm sure that a few words came up as we as I introduced your background that would have the readers interested. And I'd like to invite you to say as much or as little on any one of that. I think the thing that stands out is that no sooner are you, is the listener or reader trying to quickly get your mind around what a geneticist and neurobiology is, no sooner do we try to kind of wrap our mind around oh, yeah, I think I've heard of that. It must mean this. is. Then suddenly we're hearing about tubas and Dennis Rodman. Uh, so it makes you a most fascinating figure. And if you just want to say anything about the kind of the, the range of, of a very almost lilting version of Renaissance existence, like a Renaissance man, but with just the most curious collection of things in the range, if you want to say anything about uh, things that would certainly be of extreme interest to to listeners. Sure, I mean, when I when I uh, first went off to college, I went to music school. My parents weren't super happy about it, but I always wanted to play tuba in an orchestra. And well, I pretty quickly realized that there's not much job opportunity in that field. Um, uh, after I graduated, I wanted to come to New York City, and I found out that if you study biology or medical research, they actually pay you to go to school. Whereas if I continued to study music, I'd have to pay them for the tuition and get a job and do all that other stuff to pay the bills. So I just I just ended up in genetics totally by accident because I applied <laughs> and the person I applied to be a student of had never had a student before and he really wanted one. So he took me even though I didn't even understand the titles of my classes the first year because <laughs> my degree was in tuba, you know, from from undergrad. <laughs> um, so, you know, <laughs> Yeah. So your professor is just a little less eccentric as you. I mean, he took a tuba player as his first student in genetics and neurobiology. Exactly. You know, he, he, fantastic. Yeah. And so, you know, I just was fascinated by things. And uh, one thing about studying at Columbia is that you were allowed to take as many classes as you wanted for free. So, you know, as part of the, the package, there was no restriction. So I just... I took, uh, I, I studied Chinese as an undergraduate as my language because in music school, half the students were from China. So it was just a practical issue and it made me curious. Mm. And when I came to Columbia, I couldn't take Chinese because it conflicted with other things. So I said, well, why don't I take Korean? And just out of curiosity. And so I studied Korean for a few years and then I studied Russian for a few years. And I was just curious about the world. I think it's one thing you'll that you need to be a good scientist is just curiosity. It doesn't really matter about what you're curious about, but if you have the curiosity and the you know willingness to do the work to ask the right questions, then you know you just sort of end up where you end up. It's kind of like I always figure I take the Yogi Berra approach to life when he said, you know, you come to the fork in the road, take it. You know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that, and that's always been my approach. Whenever something comes up, I just said, sure, why not? You know, I'll try that. I'll try this. You know, and that's how I ended up kind of where I am in a weird situation. Now, another thing that connects these is that when you do work in human genetics, we're basically, I, I basically worked trying to find genes that cause diseases in humans, right? Yes. So, so in New York City, it's really, really, really difficult to do those kind of studies because we all come from different backgrounds. We're from all over the world. And, you know, any two fat people like me, you know, we probably share a lot of we may we may be similar in the things that make us fat, but we're also going to be very very different in terms of all the generic background, right? Because mm -hmm. we come from you different said places. Ge genetic background, yes. Yeah, genetic background. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. Very yeah. good. Huh. So so the idea is that I then go around the world looking for populations where people are much more similar to each other, so that that way you can more easily see what genetic variants make the, the ones that are sick different from everybody else because uh -huh. there's, there's less noise. 
So it's like a natural experiment. Uh -huh. I see. You can't do experiments on people. Like I can't say you and some woman, please give me 12 kids and I'll raise them in a cage and feed them <laughs> mouse chow. It just doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. You look for where it's happened naturally. So that's taken me to the far corners of the world looking for interesting populations, you know. So, mm -hmm. uh, so Jeanette, uh, okay, here we are on this, and, and I don't want to interfere with it despite sure, well, sure, sure, sure. having mentioned Korea. But so genetics is, genetics is primarily anchored in the vision of curing disease, or are there many different elements or parts of it? Uh, There's lots of different aspects. It's sort of like what's different about different populations, what's the history of populations? Because we are obviously all human beings are one big family, right? We're yes. all connected historically if you go back far enough. But if you look at people that are connected more recently in a family, then the differences between them are much smaller and therefore it's easier to find which genes do what because there's such a limited amount of variation. Yeah. Mm, yes. So yes, like yes. One, one project that is a, the reason I got into Korea is I was originally doing this project that came up because I'd studied Korean and Russian as an undergraduate and as a graduate student, sorry. And I went to a Korean bookstore and I saw a book about Koreans in Kazakhstan. And I'm like, what are they doing in Kazakhstan? This doesn't make any sense. So I got curious. Mm. And then I realized that the Korean diaspora, they're a very interesting population because genetically they're all very similar, but because of the way history has worked out, the cultures have been radically different. So for example, there were a lot of Koreans moved into Russia in the Russian Far East in the late 1800s. And in 1937, Stalin sent all of them to Kazakhstan in a month. They, oh. were, the, they were the first population of many to be deported in the Soviet Union. And oh, so if I may interrupt. Sure, sure. So the, in the late 1800s, they're probably, they're probably fleeing. Are they, are they already fleeing occupation, Japanese occupation by, by then or not yet? Well, interestingly, originally the migration was motivated by severe floods and famines in the northern part of Korea, okay. which has happened throughout history. It's not just because of politics. It's because that's all mountains there and there's a lot of floods and a lot of problems. There's not much arable land up there. So the SARS government invited the Koreans up into the Russian Far East because there weren't very many people there and they could do farming and agriculture and get, get okay. things sort of started up there. Yeah. Now, they did get pushed more by the Japanese occupation into China and into, into Russia. And then, and yeah, uh, and if I may, um, once once there starts to become a political cause for migration, mm -hmm. was it the case that having a community already there by dint of the prior migration into Eastern Europe, I mean Eastern Russia, that that when people are fleeing the occupation, there's already a community in Eastern Russia that would go tend to go there also, or is that not? Well, um, they, they couldn't go to China during the last dynasty because that area of China was the home of the, of the rulers, right? They came from that part of China. So China forbade people from moving in to, to, to China there. So that's why they went to Russia initially. But then, of course, yeah. after the Japanese occupation, a lot of them went into Manchuria and into Russia, you know, up there. And there were people there already, of course, that spoke Korean and that made it, made it possible for them to get along. Interestingly, mm -hmm. Stalin deported the Koreans because they looked like Japanese and he couldn't tell the difference. And they were declared enemy minority of Soviet Union on the theory that they were oh. going to side with Japan because they looked the same, even though it's absurd. It's oh, absurd. isn't that yeah. that really that's yeah. the case. So this mass migration of Koreans to Kazakhstan was simply like any idiot on the subway thinking that all people are Chinese yeah. or something yeah. like it was it was that base that that. That's really yep. they, they did it in a and month. So, they put them all in these uh, railroad cars and shipped them off in a month. You know, hundred thousand people. You know, and what was what was it? Why was Kazakhstan a safer? Well, it's the farthest place away. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's the farthest place on I Earth see. from the ocean. So it's, it, it, and the Kazakhs, of course, welcomed them and took care of them because they were also suffering in the Soviet in Soviet times. And so they right. helped them survive the first winters and uh, adapt into society there. And so, and so, your research as a geneticist this is this is kind of like a miraculous, 
bizarre up case and opportunity that you can study Koreans in Korea, and then you can study Koreans a million miles yeah. away with an entirely different history. It's a perfect kind of dream genetic geneticist study opportunity. It's like what you do with agriculture, where you take plants and grow them in the different soil conditions in a different place and see what happens to them. So we worked mm. with Koreans mm. in Kazakhstan. I've been there several times. And uh, Koreans who were adopted and raised in Sweden. So these were Koreans who were, you know, after the Korean War, there was a lot of poverty in South Korea. And so many children were adopted in foreign countries. And there's about 10,000 of them in Sweden now who are in their 30s and 40s and maybe older by now. So it's another population where they think they're tall blondes until they look in the mirror. <laughs> you know, culturally, they're completely Swedish. And in Kazakhstan, they got their entire culture stripped. The diet changed. Everything became different because they, there's no ocean there, right? They're in the, in the, in the steppes. So everything yeah. changed. So it's great yeah. in the sense for a geneticist, it was a unique opportunity, sort of what we call natural experiment. And how did uh, how did the Koreans end up in Sweden? Was it well after was the that? Korean War? There was Sweden was one of the protecting powers in the DMZ, oh. and so there were a lot of children created by Swedish soldiers that didn't really fit in South Korea because it used to be if you were half Korean, you had major yeah. problems in the society because they were very conservative. So they sent those to right. Sweden to take care of them. And it worked so well that they sent a lot more people because there's almost no domestic adoption in Sweden because nobody really gives up the kids. Okay. So if people who wanted a kid, they could get one from Korea. Now it's like China and Somalia and other places, Russia, you know. Okay. So it became it became initially part of the uh, mostly these children that were mixed yeah. and then eventually a lot of pure. A lot, yeah, like 10, 20,000 of them over the years. I see, I see. Remarkable, and so, and so, your um, is Korea uniquely benef uniquely um, these vicissitudes mm -hmm. that you've just uh, un unpacked. Is it especially fine for genetics, or is it a fusion of your kind of randomly picking Korean because China? because you stopped ch studying Chinese, was it part of your the accident of the language you chose? Or is it, would any geneticist uh, with your emphases naturally find the... Uh, no, I mean, I, like I found this just because I was interested when I, I saw a book in the library, I studied up on it, I did more research, I went out and talked to people, because I'm, I'm very curious when I find something that's interesting, I just go in depth and then it just seemed like, wow, this would be really interesting. It's a fascinating population. Why don't we try to do something? It's kind of nature versus nurture experiment. And so yes. interestingly, and the, the Kazakh government was really supportive of what we were doing, but they wanted something with Kazakh. So then I started working with Kazakh diaspora in China, where they're still working, living as nomads in Xinjiang. But that all got stopped when China started cracking down on the Muslim populations in, in, in Xinjiang. But, but it was a fascinating oh. thing because in China, they were also living a traditional existence as nomads in the Tianshan Mountains, where I, I spent a summer living with them. Whereas in Kazakhstan, they basically wow. live in cities and are completely Soviet, as they call themselves, living in you know, urban centers and lost a lot of the culture. The Kaza yeah, in Kazakhstan, because Stalin took away, you know, he collectivized agriculture and took away a lot of the traditional you know, culture they had, whereas China kept them as like a museum of minorities, kind of. I see. Until until China started getting uh, kind of cold feet about the potential of Muslim disruption or the, the classical yeah. kind of suspicion. Well, of Muslim, I was I was uh, in Udomuchi, which is the capital of Xinjiang in 2009. And at that point, there was a revolt by the Uyghur, Uyghur population. And yes. it got a bit out of control. There was a bit of an overreaction at first, and then the Uyghurs started attacking, and it just became violent. And then China cracked down. So, like for the next, we 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 had a grant to do a study there, and then we couldn't do it because for the next year, China had shut down all tele, all international telephone, internet, oh. cell phones, everything to Xinjiang. So we I couldn't see. even tell if our uh. colleagues were, you know, okay. And a couple of years later, we got back in touch and went back, but. At that point, it was impossible to do something there. I see. And so, and so with each, any, any one of your studies will be in search of some particular dimension or aspect that 
genetics as a field of study can contribute to helping human welfare in some fashion. Hopefully, or, or at least understanding the human condition. So I, I always try to de-emphasize the idea that genetics is going to lead to massive change in how we treat disease, because the genetic effects are usually really, really small, but they're important. So I think of it more as just trying to get basic basic science knowledge that someday in the future can help us understand human variation better and maybe contribute to health. But I would always okay. understate okay. The, the value to the subjects and so forth, because we really don't know. Okay. And uh, there's certain, there's certain uh, academia or, or in scholarly work, there are certain areas that are kind of touch points, like like if if you were interested in um, the relationship between religion and science or science and spirituality, the brain is a big is a great mm -hmm. place to work, right? You know, it's uh, mind brain is a big issue in terms of science and spirituality. And so, is genetics is genetics one of the touch points in the perennial question between nature and nurture? Does it shed light, especially on? on this classic kind of massive tectonics between nature. And it depends nature. on, it depends on in what area in terms of the brain, we know so little that we're babies learning to crawl. I mean, we really don't mm. understand much. I mean, we know that obviously genetics is important, but at the same time, so are other things like culture and, you know, obviously various factors about lifestyle. So one of my friends, my colleagues in Moscow, who's a, a Russian Korean, she did her thesis looking at depression in Koreans in Tashkent, Uzbekistan, compared with Koreans in Seoul, and found that in you know Uzbekistan it's like you know four or five times lower, much much higher in South Korea, but that's because of all it was basically because of, of environmental factors, it had nothing to do with genetics. No, no. What was depression. much lower? So I'm depression sorry, and, and suicidality oh, oh, oh. are a huge problem in South okay, Korea. Okay. And a lot of it is because of all the pressure, the pressure to do well on exams, to, you know, look right, to do well, right. to be exactly this sort of cookie cutter image of what a person should be that is, exists in South right. Korea. You would expect that people in Uzbekistan where it's they're poor, they're not living very well, you know, the conditions aren't great for the Koreans, especially. Um, yes. So I was asking, I was asking if genetics is one of the touch points for a classic, uh, a classic kind of debate. So there's classic, there's certain classic debates in the academy, and one of them is nature nurture. It's not only in the academy; it has great impact on social life and policy and things like that. Is nature nurture, and is genetics as a is it a field within a special commentary and a special point of helping to grasp the relationship there on this issue. It, right. I think it should nature. be. I don't think it is as much as it could be because the money is all for treating diseases that matter in rich Western countries. So oh. they want to, they want to cure diseases of old age in the West because, and that, that makes I sense see. because Congress is a bunch of old guys who don't want to die. So they'll give you money to study what will keep them alive. <laughs> But, yeah. but, the, but there are a lot of interesting projects going on, a lot of things. It's more in the anthropological genetics sort of area where people do look at yeah. things like, like what we had done, looking at migrant studies where you look at, like, for example, I was mentioning my colleague in Moscow studied the Koreans in Uzbekistan and in South Korea. And they found the big, a big difference was the enormously larger rates of depression and, and mental, mental illness in, in South Korean adolescents compared with ethnic Koreans in Uzbekistan, but that's mostly because of the way society is structured. It's the high pressure. It's the, you must do good in school. You must stay skinny, look good, marry at the right age and be, you know, this sort of perfect person to make your parents happy. Whereas in Uzbekistan, people are more lackadaisical. They didn't really care so much about that. They're just sort of living their life. And it's something that I find kind of interesting that if you look around the world, and I've been to a lot of really poor countries, in the poor countries, people often would give you a higher self-reported happiness than they do in the rich countries mm -hmm. because life is easy. There's less stress. It's easygoing. Mm -hmm. But 
the social scientists didn't like that answer in a way. So they defined happiness as availability of health care, access to education, oh, and all these things. And on those measures, Finland always comes out as like the happiest country in the world. And Finns just are like, we're happy because they're proud of being depressed all the time. Almost, <laughs> <you know? laughs> right, right. But, but self-reported happiness, which is all I really care about. I just want to feel like I'm happy. I don't care if I really am by someone else's definition. Yeah. Yeah. That often is inversely related to income. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know what? I've, I've cut here. I'll just say I'm proud of myself for being an accidental anthropologist. That I, I, because I fly all the, I, I, I spend my whole life in airplanes, and I walk through, I walk through the upper classes to get to my seat back in the. Right. <laughs> uh, cabin, right? A cabin class, whatever the name of the class is. And um, as I walk through the upper classes, they're the most miserable people, kind of jealously mm -hmm. looking at the exact millimeter of wh what's their own elbow room. And, and yep. they're just kind of just kind of aggressively ready to not get their do or their worth or something like that right and right. then as soon as you get back to the the supposed to be the miserable cabin class you know they're banging each other on the head with their suitcase and <laughs> you know and then but before you even sit down you know the guys well where are you from and there's like 14 hour right. conversations <laughs> so all the happiness is back there among the miserable you know and right, right. uh and uh i think that's exactly what you're describing it um in social classes at large or entire countries or, or societies. Yeah, because, I mean, ultimately what makes people happy isn't stuff. It's your family, your friends, your your social relationships. Yeah. Which we're all missing under lockdown, but. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. So now, we're all becoming unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, as I hear you describing um, uh, the inquiries like depression or suicidal or the different types of korean uh, uh what would they be called korean race i guess by well, genetics in south, in south korea it's, it's right it's um, not the same yeah it sounds to me that there's a certain sort of almost materialist assumption about like that like that genetics would genetics would contribute to something like depression or something like that it's almost it's almost seems to flirt with this materialist view of what what informs being human well i mean uh genetics you can obviously have genetic predispositions to depression you can't to any you sure. can uh, even of racially course. almost or well i don't i i i wouldn't i mean look every trait differs between populations if it's compatible with life because the way the way humans evolve kind of within the species is whoever has the most kids, their genes go more to the next generation, right? So there's always variation. If, 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 a, if a given trait doesn't contribute to how many children you have, it's going to be randomly distributed and it will vary all over the place around the world. If a given trait, say it again, does not. Right. So, so for example, there's a wide range of height in the world, right? Okay. And it's different. And within each ethnic group within each population, there's a different distribution of height. Yes. And part of that is because you can be short and you can still have just as many kids as a tall person can have. Right? It doesn't yes. affect how many children you have. So yes. the only thing that matters in terms of like natural selection or evolution is how many children you have. So the only traits that are constrained are ones where, you know, where your ability to have children is affected or your ability to survive is affected. And there are genetic traits which impact impact your likelihood of how many children you can have, but by, by yeah. racial uh, de 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 delineation. Well, there's some. Every trait varies between ethnic groups, like uh -huh. height or groups. ethnic. Uh huh. Yeah, between whatever groups you want to talk about. I mean, that's that's normal because any group of people is going to be a little bit different, right? Yes. The only traits where everybody is the same are traits that are heavily selected on because they have to be in a certain range, like blood pressure. Blood pressure has to be in a certain range for you to survive. I see. So those traits don't have variation between groups. Everything else will, and it'll be random, and there's huge amounts of variation. 
I see. And um, so are there certain ethnicities or ethnic groupings that have greater capacity for more more childbirth in in their fertile years is that I think, I think that more has to do with culture than it does with anything else right right that's Some what cultures, i would have yeah and in like the western world we're having very few children yes and in the developing world they're having lots of children and the biggest difference between today and say 150 years ago is that you know if you look at cemeteries in the united states or anywhere else in the world you often see 12 people in a row with the same last name died in the same year because of infectious disease. Yes. And so it used to be that you'd have 10 or 11 children and two or three would survive. Yeah. And go to the next generation. And that was how things stayed in kind of a balance. But today medical science has improved so much that if you have 10 kids, probably most of them will survive even in the poorest of countries. So that's why, for example, in most of in Africa, the median age of the population is like 17 or 18, meaning that there's a ton of children, way more than there are older people, just because in the recent years, you know, they've all been able to survive because of improvements in healthcare, sanitation and so forth. And the culture was always have a lot of kids, just like ours was before we got, you know, the healthcare and the sanitation in the West. So we're mm-hmm. getting smaller, smaller families because of that, you know, because, you know, you can't afford to keep, you know, 10 or 12 kids alive, you know. <laughs> right, right. Especially That's an State. irony, too. That's an irony, too. Yeah. Th- that prosperity makes it more difficult to support people. Which you wouldn't, would think it's the opposite reality. Well, it's like, you know, my dad had seven or eight siblings, but he, my dad was born in 1920 and yeah. they lived on a farm in the countryside. So all the kids worked and that was all good. They all worked in the farm. Right. And that used to be really important. It still is in a lot of rural areas. I mean, even in China where they had this one child per family rule that only applied to Han Chinese. If you were ethnic minorities in the countryside, you could have more children and often you needed to, to support your agricultural work or whatever it was that you were doing in the countryside. So poorer people, poorer populations need more kids because they can help out in terms of doing physical labor. One can, one can kind of put one's mind to uh, reckoning how, how these changes happen Mm -hmm. uh, naturally, but um, yeah, there's certain ironies in it. And um, just a couple of quick things. And then, uh, I think I'm going to contain, uh, like, leave this purely in these genetic questions and mm-hmm. come back to you soon. I mean, we can, uh, there's a lot I'd like to uh, continue with you about. But sure. My pleasure. Uh, as we, t- uh, as I introduced in the beginning, you, you are influential in many, many areas in, in culture, entertainment culture, in, in genetics and neurobiology, and so on and so forth. And as I as I converse with you, I find you very uh, unusually uh, resistant to the disease of seeing things in black and white. You're you're very practical in your analysis of things, uh, and I was going to touch on that in this Korea conversation, which we'll have in our next conversation. Okay. Is that when mostly when one meets experts one finds very rigid lines and very and and both analyses and solutions are are very binary oftentimes in their field regardless of how profound the knowledge of the expert is but uh when i when i converse with you it's uh, it's very fluid it's very it's very practical that it's kind of like instead of throwing the table away you know just fold up a piece of paper eight times and you know you, it, it won't rock anymore it's, it's something like your your analysis even a very profound and uh, rare academically rarefied matters it's very fluid um, and so i'm wondering is your is your study of of the human being internationally or, or the human condition, it, has that influenced a kind of a, a, a kind of a harmonious impulse in your thinking and analysis and, and proposals and solutions and recommendations? Well, that, go ahead. Uh-huh. Yeah, I think uh, 
one of the things that happens with the way our uh, academia and science and everything has progressed so rapidly in the last you know hundred years is that people have gotten to the point where they are micro specialized in some really small aspect of something where there's so much knowledge out there that they pick a small area and become an absolute master of that area like no one else like no one else in the world but it's really 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 focused and tiny i'm not an expert on anything i i always insist on that my like my dad always told me an expert ain't nothing but a country boy away from home <laughs> it was his words of wisdom to me as a kid you know <laughs> i love that <laughs> and and you know to me, it's sort of like, I, I mean, I'm very curious about a lot of things, but I'm not like a micro specialist on anything. So professionally, like as a geneticist, I kind of am a big picture person. I try to think of the big picture and then I talk to the different specialists. And I also often view my job more as being kind of a translator in the sense that I'm, I understand statistics. I understand medicine. I understand genetics, not enough to be a super focused expert at it but enough to speak the languages of all these different fields. So I can explain to a mathematician what the geneticist is talking about, where the geneticist and the mathematician can't talk to each other. It's okay. as if they were speaking Farsi and Korean. Mm. You know? and so I think that that's my ability. So I don't consider myself an expert on anything, but I know a little bit about a lot of stuff. Mm. And so I think that that's served me in terms of helping me think of my questions in genetics or in other areas of life in a different way than an expert would, because the expert really sees the details of what's going on inside a tree, but doesn't see the forest. I see the forest, but I have no idea what's going on inside a tree. Mm, mm, mm. And I think there are different roles for these different sort of people with different kind of expertise, you know, so yeah. that's like part of it. You know, I don't claim to be an expert on anything. Certainly not on Korea. I don't think anybody is, um, but I certainly am not. But but I've experienced it because I lived in North Korea, you know, and I've lived in I haven't lived in South Korea, but I spent a lot of time there, you know, and yeah. doing that. I'm exposed to a lot of things in a very different way than an expert would. You know, it's like when I go to some place like when I've been in Iran or when I've been in parts of former Soviet Union or other Afghanistan or other difficult places. I'm not threatening to people because I'm not a, a political scientist. I'm not an international relations person. I'm not a government person. So they talk openly, you know? Yes. So yeah. I, I always try to take the Captain Kirk approach from Star Trek and you go someplace, just try to learn about it. Don't try to influence them. Just try to learn about it. Right. Understand how their society works and don't try to change it. And people in places like North Korea really do appreciate that. And they give me a lot more trust and access and they're open with me simply because I'm not threatening them. I'm not judging them. I'm just listening to them, you know? And I think that that's a big part of it. You know, I think you're ex exactly right. And the one element that you, you might have a blind spot to in it all is your own humility. Because when you say, I know a little bit about <laughs> a lot of things, that little bit would be, a mountain for most of us in, in, in almost any of them. Uh, and so I guess that's the one ingredient which kind of completes the picture is that, um, is that needed, needed quality of humility that completes the picture and spawns the inquisitiveness and the simple curiosity and the listeningness uh, uh, not the assumption that you have any a special capacity to come to a foreign circumstance and imagine yourself so capable of having the right solution to it. Sure. But I think that there is part of it, like imagining solution. I approach it. I don't, I'm not, I don't see necessarily things as a problem. I just see this is a, like a society. So I'm curious about it, just like it would be in science. So I just want to learn. I don't want to, judge i think judgmentalism is a big problem yeah. you know people always have a preconception like with north korea for example it, people that have never been there think they know what it's like and they assume that what they've read is true and what they know is true and they go in with a bias and then they never 
can experience what it's really like. Yeah, they can you know? ne- they can stand in the middle of it forever yeah. and never see what's there. That's right. And if you judge someone also, they're not going to talk to you. If you tell someone you I think you're wrong or I think that you're everything you're doing is bad, then why would they have a conversation with you? Right. No human being wants to be told you're wrong and you're bad because that shuts down conversation. You just go in and say, hi, I'm Joe. Who are you? What do you do? Tell me about yourself, you know? Right. And I don't think that I have a higher, a better moral compass than other people. I think sometimes they're different, but I always want to hear their perspective. Yeah. 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 And I think um, I happen to believe that people can feel that even when nothing is said. Yes, absolutely. They feel it when nothing is said, and the, the silence is there when you don't know why it's there. Uh, well, an because it's yeah. An interesting thing on that topic, you know, I've I've lived part of the year for the last twenty years in 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 Finland, and Finns don't talk much, and I've learned an appreciation for silence in a way that I never had before. So I went on a, a like a, I saw a friend of mine. You know, you see your friend on the street, you go, oh, let's go have a beer. So we'd go to the bar and we have a beer together and we'd sit there and no one would say anything. We're just enjoying each other's company because he's my friend. I want to have a beer with him. But if I didn't have, if they don't have anything to say, they don't say anything. Mm. And it's actually in America that would seem like a pregnant pause where, oh God, I got to fill the space. I got to say something. Yeah. I'm nervous. Yeah. But after experiencing it for a long time, you really start to appreciate that you can have this camaraderie and a feeling of intimacy with your friends without having to talk all the time. Yeah. And silence, like you just said, communicates a lot. And it's something I think that's really unappreciated in America. It's true. It's true. Americans are uncomfortable with Mm -hmm. silence and a strong surge of emotion. They're uncomfortable. They usually need to joke it away. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Professor, uh, this has taken quite a, a surprising turn, but I think you have left the li- our listeners with a number of real gems. And I'm very, uh, I, I trust y- you've assured me that we can do this more often because there's a lot I want to ask you uh, mm-hmm. about a number of the, of the fields I've introduced at the outset. My pleasure. And wonderful. Uh, so I'll, I'll wrap up here. And I will be back in touch very soon to continue on this and several other uh, important topics that you have a lot to contribute for. I don't know if I have much to contribute, but I'm always happy to talk. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Professor. It was really enjoyable. Thank you. It's a pleasure to to talk with you again. It's been, what, six months? (laughs) Yeah, it's been too long. God bless. You too. Bye-bye. Bye.